thousands of people have mysteriously vanished in America's wilderness. Join us as we dive into the deep end of the unexplainable and try to piece together what happened. You are listening to Locations Unknown. What's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Locations Unknown. I'm your co-host, Joe Irado, and with me, as always, is a man who turned down the role of Ken in the Barbie movie to play the bomb in Oppenheimer, <laughs> Mike Van de Bogart. Uh, thanks, Joe. Uh, that's a good one. I came up with that one right now. Wow. Wow. I know. I know. Pretty good. <laughs> Getting better. I'd uh, just like to thank everyone once again for tuning in to the show. Uh, just a quick Patreon shout out. Just to have one new subscriber, Kayla uh, Bibber. So thank you. Probably you. said her name wrong too. I probably did. Biber Bibber. Oh, that's B I B B E R. Yeah, Bibber. So thank you so much for supporting the show. Uh, episode shout out to our very own Kim Turn for uh, doing uh, the bulk of the research for this one. So thank you again, Kim. And, and she did a lot better on this one than the last one. She did. A lot. <laughs> She did great. No, she's been doing good. Yeah. No, she's got to figure out our style. That's hard to do. So it's going to take a couple episodes. So yeah, we're two wacky guys. Yeah. <laughs> it's like the uh, the sca- two wild and crazy guys yeah. from SNL. Yeah. Like half our audience, based on the metrics that we receive, will understand what that was. The other half will not. Yeah. So uh, uh, where do I go from there? Um, oh. Call the phone number. To call- give them the phone number, dude. 208-391-6913. If you want to call and leave a voicemail, anything is fair game. Just remember, we may play it on a future episode. So... Do we have a backlog? I, I feel like we haven't done a phone episode in a long time. Do we have any type of backlog built up? Probably. Oh, you haven't even checked? No. Okay. I mean, yes, I've checked. I see emails when we get voicemails, and I read them usually. It'll like... Oh, it tells you what it's saying in, in like word format? Yeah, it's kind of, you know, broken English, but I get the gist of it. All right, that's good. So, that's cool. Maybe we'll do that on our uh, subscriber-only episode next. Yeah, we are recording one of those. Yes. So well, we had something fun planned, so that'll, that'll be a good time. Yeah. Uh, and if you want to support the show, there are many ways to do it. You can do it on Patreon, YouTube memberships, premium subscriptions on Apple. You can also just buy stuff from our stores. We've got some things left, a couple hats and, I don't know, whatever's there, buy it. <laughs> just buy it. <laughs> just buy it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody, let's gear up and get out to explore locations unknown. December 1st, 1946. A young college student in Vermont was finishing her lunch in the dining hall of the college dorm. She intended to go hiking in green in the Green Mountain National Forest. After hitchhiking to the trailhead, she set out on a long trail and conversed with one individual about the length of the trail. This is the last anyone would hear from her again. Join us this week as we investigate the disappearance of Paula Jean Weldon. So this week brings us to Vermont in the Green Mountain National Forest. It is about 399,000 acres, so it's similar to the size of Canyonlands National Park. Uh, the sublocation that we're talking about is Long Trail, and it is a very long trail. It is very <laughs> uh, appropriately named. Yes. <laughs> it is 272 miles, uh, 166 miles of side trails, 70 backcountry campsites, and the oldest continuous footpath in the United States. Did you know that? I had never even heard of this trail. 
Well, before this, episode. or you might have, because if any time anyone said long trail, it could have been that. I feel like the Ice Age Trail in Wisconsin's longer, but it's probably not continuous, and it doesn't go straight. Yeah, it loops. So that's true. Uh, it was established on April twenty fifth in nineteen thirty two. Uh, and constructed between 1910 and 1930. So that was the forest in 1932. Yes. The trail in 19. Oh, the trail was constructed then. Okay. Yeah, it took two decades to build the trail. I could imagine. That's a long trail. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to have a lot of dad <laughs> jokes this, this episode. Uh, visitors per year. So a specific number is unknown, but within a day's drive of 70 million people. So I'm sure people pop in and out all the time. Oh, yeah. Uh, habitation history of the area. So before the Europeans arrived, the Wabanaki Confederacy, as well as the Mohicans, were the most dominant populations in recent centuries. The French sailor Jacques Cartier was perhaps the first to see the Green Mountains in the mid-1500s. Green Mountain National Forest was founded due to overlogging, forest fires, and flooding in the area. Now, a lot, like go a ahead. Lot of those, go ahead. Oh. A lot of those national forests were founded to stop logging. Okay, like they were starting to overlog them, and they said, no. Yeah, we need to protect the land. Heck yeah, good for them. <laughs> All right, now only around half of the land is federally owned and still allows logging on the premises, but with restrictions. So they just can't just wipe it all clean, I'm yeah. guessing. Uh, some interesting facts about Vermont. Vermont is called the Green Mountain State because in French, vert means green. It's probably vert. <laughs> <laughs> and Mont means mountain. Ver- Vermont. Very literal. In Vermont. Vermont. <laughs> the Green Mountain formed over 400 million years ago and is thought to be one of the oldest in the world. That's actually really cool. Yeah. Uh, 78% of Vermont's land is forests and brings in about $1.5 billion of revenue for each state. Uh, for the state. I don't know why I said each state. <laughs> I'm like, I like screwed up the... The breakdown, I'm having a rough one already. Yeah, it's a tough one today. Yeah, Vermont. <laughs> Vermont is known for mining granite, marble, and slate, which are the state rocks. There is a legend that a lake monster named Champ lives <laughs> in Lake <laughs> Champlain. Champlain? Champ. Ch- Champlain. Champlain? Maybe. Maybe. Champ. Champ. Who, uh, what movie is there a guy <laughs> named Champ? Anchorman. Anchorman. <laughs> yeah. That's a- whammy. <laughs> <laughs> Dean Ellis goes to the plate and whammy. It's out of there. <laughs> Vermont is the largest producer of maple syrup in the U.S. and produces around 500,000 gallons a year. Uh, Vermont has the second smallest state population. Uh, a little bit about the climate there. So Vermont is a humid continental climate with muddy springs in general, uh, mid-early summer, hot Augusts. The rural northeastern section, known as the Northeast Kingdom, often averages uh, 10 degrees Fahrenheit colder than the southern areas of the state during the winter. The annual snowfall averages between 60 and 100 inches, depending on elevation. Vermont is the seventh coldest state in the country. It's like, I don't know if I want to go there. <laughs> so, <laughs> the biggest formation in Vermont is the Green Mountains, which run on the western edge of the state in a north-south direction. Did you know that that's the, one of the oldest mountains in the world? I did. I know. I just heard it's of crazy. that somewhere. It's like 400 million years old. Yeah, something like that. I don't yeah. know. That doesn't sound right. Uh, <laughs> west of the mountains is the Hudson River, Lake George, and Lake Champlain, where Champ lives. These serve as the physical boundaries between Vermont and New York. These bodies of water were actually the main source of transportation to facilitate commerce. The other major river in the state is to the east of the Green Mountains, and that is the Connecticut River. Uh, Because Vermont is a temperate broadleaf and mixed forest biome, most of the state is covered in conifers and northern hardwoods. So what are the types of dangers we can expect to see in Vermont? Uh, There are black bear, coyotes, foxes, timber rattlesnakes, moose, and ticks. Nothing too crazy. No. Uh, the alpine zones, quickly changing weather, hypothermia, exposure, and potential lack of shelter you can have in those areas. And these are kind of specific to the Long Trail area in... Yeah, where there's no trees or any type Around the Green Mountain area. ...cover or anything like that. Yep. So, uh, bears. Uh, they have become more active around the Long Trail system in the last few years. As of July 24th, 2019, hikers are now required to use a bear box, bear can, or hang all their food and refuse, etc., 12 feet from the ground and 6 feet from a tree and branch, and carry out all trash on the Green Mountain National Forest land. Uh, 
Did you see a video? Uh, there was a black bear who like figured out how to get a hanging bag. Oh, really? Like it was totally hung very appropriately. Yeah. Distance from the tree and everything. He climbed the tree and like figured out the rope and was shaking it until it broke free and then they're, got it. They're evolving. Oh yeah, they're figuring it out. <laughs> it's my favorite quote. Why is it so hard to get into the bear trash can? And it was the Yos- it was like a Yosemite or I forget. There's a ranger who said it. You can look it up. And he said, there's a significant overlap between our dumbest tourists and the smartest bears. <laughs> well, uh, to our future bear overlords, um, <laughs> we love you. Yes. And we're sorry we get your ancestry wrong <laughs> sometimes. In we only got it wrong like twice. Not e- Maybe once. Maybe once. Yeah. And then repeated it before someone corrected us. Yes. So... Whatever, that's fine. Uh, mud season. The state of Vermont closes all trails on state land, including those on Camel's Hump and Mount Mansfield, from the beginning of mud season through Friday of Memorial Day weekend. Why? <laughs> <laughs> Melting snow means muddy trails, especially at higher elevations. Muddy trails mean hikers are more likely to walk next to the path, damaging plants and expediting erosion. So, leave no trace. They literally have to shut the thing down. Yep. So let that be a lesson to you guys. If you're hiking outside and it looks like you might get a little muddy, you're outside. Get a little muddy. Don't trample good plants. Yeah. Who are you trying to look good for? I mean, the bears. Our bear overlords. Yeah, especially (laughs) especially the grizzlies in California. (laughs) So (laughs) hunting season. Uh, If you're going along the long trail, if you're going to take a long trail on long trail, uh, during hunting season, you're going to want to wear blaze orange clothing. And for those who are not from the Midwest, if you've ever seen anybody with bright orange that looks like it's glowing, that is called blaze orange. Yeah, maybe leave your uh, Halloween, you know, deer Halloween costume at home. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, you want to have that visible from both front and back. You want to avoid wearing brown or white, the colors of deer. Um, <laughs> I can't imagine your goal why. Is to get shot. Yeah, I mean that that could be the goal. <laughs> yeah. Some people do uh, suicide by cop. Others maybe long trail hunting season dressed as a deer. Yeah. Um, Be especially careful while hiking in valleys and near roads and trailheads. Avoid hiking during dawn and dusk due to low visibility. Uh, Please leave dogs at home. If you do bring a furry friend, make sure they have blaze orange on as well. They make some really cool blaze orange vests for dogs. Yeah. Uh, Wave to make your presence known to hunters. They totally love it when you're trampling right through them and they've been sitting there all day and haven't seen anything. Yeah. (laughs) They'll be real happy about that. So uh, the winter, you want to start your start your hike early. Stark. That's how you say start and hike together. <laughs> start your hike early. Daylight is short in the winter and darkness comes suddenly. You want to carry a topographical map and compass and familiarize yourself with the route ahead of time. The long trail blazes are white, which is harder to see against snow. In deep drifts, blaze blazes may be buried or appear to at knee height consider using snowshoes and micro spikes uh you want to know the signs of hypothermia and frostbite and how to treat them the irony is um i've always thought about this one of the signs of hypothermia is disorientation yeah so you won't know because you're disorientated (laughs) hey there you go use layering to avoid sweating and carry an extra change of clothes such as dry set of long underwear and wool socks Remember to hydrate, even if it's cold. Dehydration increases uh, susceptibility to hypothermia. Susceptibility to hypothermia. Whew. Excuse me. That was a rough one for me. You need to get you some, like, smelling salts or something. Oh, I should get smelling <laughs> salts. I would do that. Just to, That'll be my new, like, get ready for the episode. But I'll wait till I've started already so everyone can just... All of a sudden, you just hear screaming. Yeah, I know. I'm back! <laughs> it seems to work. As soon as Rogan did it, everyone started doing it, and that's how you got views. You just write smelling salts and, and the <laughs> episode name. So it'll be like, hey, it's the episode we're doing smelling salts. Yeah. So uh, tips for hiking in Vermont wilderness uh, on the long trail. Make sure to have the 10 essentials on your hike. Navigation, map and compass we talked about. Uh, sun protection, that's sunscreen, hat, sunglasses. You don't want to have exposed skin. Uh, insulation, that's the extra clothing. Rain gear, things that can keep uh, your current clothes from getting wet is ideal. Uh, Illumination, so that's like a flashlight or a headlamp. I recommend a headlamp. Yep. And uh, change of batteries, too. Uh, first aid supplies include any meca- any, medi- eh, any medication you take regularly, uh, as well as some bandages and things to uh, deal with minor injuries. Uh, fire, waterproof matches, lighters, or candles. 
Uh, just some tools or repair kit for gear and know how to use them. So that could be as simple as a patch. You don't want to get a hole in your tent and then it's going to start raining and you have no way to deal with it. It yeah. could be as simple as lots of people will wrap uh, duct tape around their Nalgene bottles mm-hmm. so, that so you can peel it off. There's lots of really cool ways to store gear without storing gear. Yeah. Uh, nutrition, extra food. So if you think you need some food, double it. If you can, if it's not too heavy, like, uh, if you're going to bring four protein bars, bring eight. Why yeah. not? It doesn't hurt. Uh, hydration, always bring a lot of water and then filtration systems or treatment or both. Uh, the biggest thing, I don't think we've talked about this. Some of those pumps and filters, they can get like stuck yeah. and they can clog up and stuff. It's hard to use. And if you don't know how to backwash it properly, you might want to just use like your bandana to filter out like crud in water and then yeah. drop some tablets in there. Those are the easiest way. And they yeah, I mean, I, uh, especially if you're hiking in a muddy area and you're, you're trying to filter a lot of muddy water, I've usually have to clean the water filter every time I'm, I'm back. Yeah. And it's so long. It's, it takes a while. It's, it's not something you could do out on the trail. Yeah. Like what I like doing is I bring, um, well, I have that really cool filter where it converts any water with salt into yeah. like a brine that's like chlorine. You use electrolysis yeah. and you can dump that in. But then I always have a life straw as a backup. Yeah. Life straws are cool. You can like dip it into a puddle and just drink right from it. Those it's are, awesome. Those are cool. Um, one they of clog our, up though. Yeah. One of our buddies had this UV light system that you could dip into your Nalgene bottle. Oh, and you stir it. You leave it on for like 10 or 15 minutes and it, yep. it it's probably not going to get everything. But if you're like in a pinch, it'll probably keep you from, you know... Getting Jardia. Getting really sick, like, right away. Enough yeah. time to get you out of there. Those work pretty good. If you filter out the big particulate, those work very well. Yeah. That's what I've done. And that's where, like, I always have a bandana, uh, especially if it's summer. You can literally, if I have two containers, you put a bandana over your Nalgene with, like, a little bowl yeah. and dump the crap water in it, and then it will get the mud and stuff. Then you can rinse your bandana off, and then you have a nice, cool bandana to put on your head. And yeah. then you treat your water, so you have the crud out, and then you treat it. And, I mean, last resort, you can get the tablets. They're, yes. like, the size of an allergy medicine bottle. Yeah, I have those all the time, too. And, I mean, it's not the water's not going to taste that great, but it's going to kill whatever's in it, so. Absolutely. So, yeah, that's I, I can't believe we haven't covered that before. <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> like Jardia is not good to have if you're in the backcountry. You'll dehydrate and stuff, so. Yeah. Uh, last thing, emergency sh- shelter. And now that doesn't mean it's got to be like a tent. If you have one of those space tarps, things like that, or an emergency blanket, all it is is keeping dry and warm. Mm -hmm. You can wrap up and just sleep on the ground if you have something like that. It's not ideal, but it can work. And it it might, you know, like I've hiked in areas where I've had a tent and it's gotten soaked from the weather. You could take something like a blue tarp that you have folded up in your backpack as kind of a rain shield. Oh, sure. From your tent to kind of try and keep you warm and dry. If Absolutely. So I always bring a tarp. Yep. Absolutely. So uh, you want to practice safe hiking. Uh, you're really responsible for your own safety. So you want to know if you have the gear, like we talked about, if it's the first time you're using it, don't have your hike be the first time you're using it. <laughs> yeah. Practice with it a little bit. Get an idea of how it works. Um, do some local, uh, you know, Go to like a little state park near your house and do some camping. Yeah, go or just make a muddy puddle in your backyard and drink from <laughs> yeah. it with the life straw. Yeah. Just give it a shot. See what it tastes like. It, it's bad. Yeah. <laughs> but it's safe. That's, that's the thing. Yeah. Uh, leave your plans. We always say this. Make sure everybody knows what you're doing and where you will be and do not deviate. Or if yeah. you think you might, tell them the areas where you might. Uh, if you're with a group, stay together. Uh, and know when to turn back. Uh, it's better to not make your destination. And then guess what? I always think of, uh, I've had two attempts now at that one mountain. I still haven't summited yet. Yeah. You know, it's cool. I get to go back and try it again because yeah. it's beautiful. If I did it, I wouldn't want to go back and do that one. So <laughs> yeah. I get to go to that same one three times and that's fine. Uh, and for emergencies, if you are headed out for just an hour or so, an injury, severe weather or a wrong turn be- can become life threatening. So don't assume you will be rescued. Know how to rescue yourself if possible. Now, Mike, what do you say we talk about Paula Jean Weldon? Yes. So, uh, like we said, her name was Paula Jean Weldon. Uh, date of birth, October 19th, 1928. She went missing on December 1st of 1946. Her remains have not been found. She was a female. She was 18 at the time of her disappearance, and she would be 94 years young if she was still alive today. She was five foot five inches. She was 122 pounds. She had blonde hair worn in a long uh, bob. She, we're looking at a picture of her right now. She looks like any 
picture <laughs> of a female say, from like the 40s. Yeah, it's it looks like AI created this. <laughs> yes. Like I said, give me a... I, I was going to say basic, but that's mean. Like just standard. Like, you know, if you like look at pictures of women from the 40s, it, yeah. this is what you see. What she's wearing, no smile, just staring at the camera. Everyone stared at the camera. Nobody yeah. smiled. Uh, she had uh, blue eyes. Um, no, they're they're black. <laughs> <laughs> there is a colorized photo of her. Oh, okay, <laughs> so yeah, for those of you listening, I'm looking at black and white photos of her. <laughs> uh, clothing last seen in, she was uh, in a red parka with fur trimmed hood, blue jeans, size six and a half or seven, white top Strider sneakers with heavy soles, a small gold. Uh, Elgin wristwatch with a black band. Uh, the watch has a repairer's f- f- 13050 HD scratched on the back case. I'm not sure what that means. Um, personality, she was uh, very bright and ambitious. She was studying at art at Bennington University as a sophomore, but was about to switch to botany as a result of poor academics and art. Um, I think they were just telling you what was etched on the back of the watch. So if someone found like oh. a watch, like that was, it says it was scratched on the back of the case or that something. That makes sense. Yeah. So if you like found somebody or I forget a watch, there was no Google back then. Yeah. They have to like say, Hey, like here it is. You're <laughs> yeah. not going to have pictures or anything. Yeah. Um, so as an art student, she did black and white photography mural. Uh, she was a mural painter and charcoal sketches, but had a special interest in botany. Uh, experience in the wilderness. Paula consistently hiked both in groups and alone as, and was considered very physically fit. Um, just a couple of people involved in the case. Elizabeth Johnson was a roommate. Lewis Knapp was one of the people that picked her up while she was hitch- hitchhiking. Um, Lewis Webster Jones was the school president. So we will jump right into the timeline of this one. And, this is an interesting case. You know, usually these cases that are older like this, there's a you know less detail. And this case, there was quite a bit of detail on um, Paula and kind of you know her whereabouts before she went missing. So uh, pretty interesting. So it's December first, nineteen forty six. It's between two thirty and two forty five p.m. So Paula had just finished her. She did two shifts at the dining hall and headed back to her dorm. She got to her room, she changes into walking clothes, and tells her roommate, uh, Elizabeth Johnson, that she wants to go for a hike as a study break. Uh, Earlier, she had also told friends that she wanted to hike the long trail, but never told her room exactly where she was going. So it was kind of assumed she was going there, and they, you know, someone actually did see her on the trail. So um, according to Johnson's recollections, Paula left around 2.45 p.m. Uh, She wore like we said, a distinctive red coat with fur collar and she had jeans and lightweight sneakers. The weather at the time that she left was pretty comfortable. It was 50 degrees. It was a Sunday, uh, which could have explained why she was wearing kind of lighter clothing. But by the evening, it grew much colder and windier with snow. And by Monday, which was just the next day, it was nine degrees um, in Bennington. So, oh, wow. She definitely wasn't prepared for the conditions coming. Um, but I can see why that's if she just probably thought she'd be back by night. So, you know, 50 degrees up. I don't know what type of weather forecasting they have back then too. So it's not like she would know. Yeah. But you know, I mean, 50 degrees sounds like great weather to hike in. Uh, Yeah. Not too hot, not too cold. Yeah. So in December, it's probably very crisp. Yeah. So Danny Fager, who is, uh, the owner of a gas station uh, just across from the college gate at the time later reported that he saw a beautiful, light young woman in a red coat. Uh, He said the girl ran over the the edge of a gravel pit near the college entrance and then back down. Then she went out of sight. And later on in the search, on the basis of this statement, the entire gravel area was later uh, bulldozed and examined, but nothing was found. So That's interesting. So we do have a sighting of her leaving the college. It's now December 1st, 1946, about 2.45 p.m. Paula, uh, in this, I guess, was common back in the 40s. Joe and I were kind of joking about it before. You know, I, would ne- I don't think I'd consider hitchhiking now. 
in 2020. No, I don't think so at yeah. all. Just it's just no because nobody does it. That's the irony. Is it's if it was still a popular thing, you'd have yeah. more normal people doing it. I think now it's very uncommon unless you're in like a specific area. So when I was at Electric Forest, a lot of people hitchhike around Rothbury. Yeah, but it's like everyone's doing a thing. Yeah, that's why it's 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 not like in the middle of nowhere you're just gonna randomly hitchhike. So I feel like there's just too many crazy people now. Uh, you, okay, you know what? I kind of want to take it back. <laughs> I want to take it back because around here, that would be the case. Yeah, I don't know about like real rural places. That might still be a thing. Like yeah. in small towns Maybe. where they're just like, yeah, literally nothing happens. You just go get a, get a ride by somebody. That could be, that could still be. Could be. We have enough listeners. If, if hitchhiking is still common in your area, let us know. That'd be interesting. To yeah. Know. So uh, she, her plan was to hitchhike from the college to the trailhead, which wasn't that far away. So she started hitchhiking around 2.45 near the Bennington campus when a passing motorist picked her up. She told him uh, she was going to hike the long trail off Route 9 near uh, Glastonbury Mountain. The driver dropped her off on R- Route 9 about three miles from her destination. It's now obviously the same day. It's just before 3 p.m. Um, Paula was then seen by a gentleman named Lewis. Oh, and you said he dropped him off at Route 9? Yeah, Route 9, about three miles from the trailhead. Okay, so here's the trailhead. This is Glassbury Mountain, so... Somewhere. Yeah, so she's not in Woodford yet, so... She was coming from uh, Bennington, you said? Yeah. So she's coming up Route 9, three miles before trailhead, so she was walking up Woodford Road, which is Route 9. Yeah. Or turns into Vermont Route 9. Okay, so she was dropped off somewhere here and then had to walk three miles to get to... Here's the trailhead right here. Yeah. Okay, cool. Wow, that's really... That was the loudest speaker I've ever heard on yeah. a motorcycle. Holy cow. That might actually get picked up in the microphones. That was, that was a loud one. I can Let still hear it. Oh, yeah. Holy cow. Yeah, he's way that way. I'm showing the screen right now across the bridge over there. That reminds me of those videos. I got this guy. I saw a video. He had like 10 subwoofers in his trunk of his car and like the car looked like it was like just jello. Yeah. <laughs> it was I just mean, breaking. It was just like vibrating. <laughs> I was like, how is he... Like his ears must just be destroyed, I, or he's just dead now. Like that <laughs> yeah. can't be good for your heart. Have you ever been no. in a car with a lot of bass? Yeah, it like it kind of hurts your chest, but yeah. not like pain outside. Like the insides of your body are hurting. Yeah, <laughs> like it's just like ooh. Like I remember being a teenager and some dude in my in my high school like put some subs in his car and an yeah. amp. He's like, dude, come sit in my car and feel. And he just put it. <laughs> we're just like. <laughs> And the trunk's rattling because yeah. he didn't have enough money to like do anything else yeah. except for put the sub in. So like sometimes the trunk would pop open because <laughs> the bass was so powerful. And I'm like, this can't be healthy. And he would just drive around all day in yeah. that whatever, just slowly destroying his car. I, yeah, like this, <laughs> like at a, ce- a a molecular cellular level, like just disintegrating, <laughs> like his protein bonds and his DNA, yeah. just little bits at a time. Yeah. All well, right. Anyway, anyway. There's, there's a tangent. Yeah. So, uh, like we said, it's just before 3 p.m. Paula was last seen, or Paula was then seen by a gentleman named Louis Knapp who lived in Woodford. His description matches Paula. She got into his car while getting, um, she got into his car while getting into his truck. The girl slipped and fell, and he said, be careful, warn Knapp. Um, he drove her as far as his house on Route 9, about two and a half miles from Long Trail. No further words were spoken between them until Knapp dropped her off. After thanking him for the ride, she moved on. Okay, so she was started walking from three miles away, then got picked up by this other guy who is heading back to Woodford. Yeah, from Bennington. I'm gonna zoom out a little bit more here. So she was going this way. Someone dropped her off. Where probably is Bennington like, College? Can you find that? I don't know if you can. Oh, I'm I'm sure I can, but probably oh, not, you're in not, not in all Hold trails. Hold on, let me. Okay. I'll switch to I'll switch to Google Earth. I'm just curious where. Yeah, I don't know if this will tell me. It might. I don't even know if the college exists anymore. I'm sure it does. There we oh, go. There it is. College. They get money and just never go away. <laughs> All right. Bennington College. Whoa. Okay. If this is, yeah, there's Woodford. Okay. Oh, so okay. It's, there we go. It's uh the western, so, northwestern so part of Bennington. So she hitchhiked from around Bennington College two, three miles from the trailhead. Okay. That's where she got off first. And then... Yeah, so she, Bennington College is right around probably this big building right here. Mm-hmm. 
that looks like a big building in a small town. So it's probably North Side Drive, hitchhiked roughly to here, like where that guy probably lived, hopped out, started walking, then hitchhiked. He got her all the way to the trailhead? No, he got her to his house, which was about two and a half miles from Long Trail. You said he lived in Woodford? That's what the notes said. That's weird because he would have driven past at least, unless there's another trailhead somewhere else in Woodford. No, I mean, it just he might live like on the out. They might, I don't know. if he lives on the outskirts of Woodford, they might just say he like, lives in Woodford. Is that his house? I, I don't know. This was in 1946. I don't know. Oh, yeah, maybe. Maybe there was houses there. All right. So we, we don't, it's it's from the 40s. We're just going to let that, that piece slide. <laughs> yeah. So um, from the point where she was dropped off by Knapp, she either hitchhike or walk the rest of the way to start the trail. Um, they don't really know. There okay. wasn't a lot of detail on that. So now it is uh, 4 p.m. on December 1st. This is the last, confers- uh, last confirmed sighting of Paula when she spoke to a man on the trail, Ernie uh, Whitman, and asked her how far it extended. He told her it went all the way to Canada. Ernie and three other um, friends were coming out of camp in Bickford Hollow. He cautioned her against going very far as she was not well-dressed and the sun would be going down soon. Several other Woodford residents claimed to have seen her in the vicinity of Fay Fuller Camp further up the trail, but the reliability of these reports is uncertain. So at this time, the sun would have been setting around 5 p.m., and it did begin snowing a few hours after that uh, with accumulations of up to three inches. Uh, her roommate, when she didn't return that evening, thought that she must have gone to the library to study for exams. This would be the last uh, time anyone would have seen Paula. There were a lot of other sightings, allegedly, that saw her, but we'll get into that, but none of them really panned out. So it's now December 2nd, 1946. This is uh, Monday morning. Her roommate became concerned when she realized she'd never returned home from the previous night. Uh, Later that morning, she notified the school authorities of Paula's disappearance. At the time, Bennington students were required to sign themselves out if they planned to stay out past 11 p.m., then check in with the school security officer upon their return. Paula had done neither of those things. When she failed to attend her classes the following Monday, Bennington College officials notified her family and the police. Uh, William Archibald Weldon... Paula's father rushed from their home in Stamford, Connecticut, and organized a search. That evening, the media put out her story, and authorities in New York and Massachusetts were alerted, and photographs were circulated. As no one knew where Paula might have gone, no formal search and rescue effort was started yet. So, um, it is now December 3rd of 1946, which is a Tuesday, Um R.N. Thompson, the manager of Vermont Transit in Burlington, said he would contact all bus drivers who left Bennington on Sunday afternoon to find if she boarded any of those buses. Searches were also uh, carried out on the college campus and the section of Long Trail leading to the Glastonbury Fire Station, which crosses Route 9 on the Brattleboro Road near Hell Hollow and Bickford Hollow. Um. It, Say reminds, all that ten times fast. Reminds me of the movie Sleepy Hollow. Was that a movie? Oh, yeah, that's a great movie. Johnny yeah. Depp? It's an older one. Yes. I think there's a show called Sleepy Hollow. Yeah. On Fox. I don't no, know. Yes. Yeah. There was. I'm pretty certain. <laughs> yeah. A lot of tangents in this episode. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, so Frank Tishorn, superintendent of buildings and grounds at the college, took charge of the squads of volunteers who searched on Tuesday and Wednesday. A hunter called Herman Spencer who usually stayed in the Sauceville camp halfway to Glatzenberry Tower, assisted in the search, as did Bennington College students, Boy Scouts, about 25 Williams College students, members of the Green Mountain Club, and 30 others from the Bennington area. So this kind of reminds me of when that kid went missing in um, the Smoky Mountains. Remember that episode? Yes. Where they had so many 
people who really wanted the help but were just inexperienced in searching kind yeah, of yeah and just causing more of a problem than anything else yeah they were like it, searchers like falling off pickup trucks getting hurt and yeah they're like, like <laughs> rescuing the people who are trying to help them and it was just cause like just trampling over stuff and yeah, yeah i think we have a similar situation in this case where everyone means well but i mean you've got boy scouts searching you've got other college kids to be fair the Boy Scouts at that time probably did the best job. Probably, <laughs> probably did. If we're being honest, they probably knew. They were probably shaking their heads at all the adults wandering around. Yeah, but it just reminds me of that other case that my guess is they had these people, while meaning well, probably did more harm in the search than, you know, trained professionals sure. that we have searching now. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Sheriff W. Clyde Peck was familiar with the long trailer, joined the search on Wednesday night. At 5.30 p.m. that day, Ernie Whitman, a night watchman at the Banner newspaper, noticed a photograph of Paula on the front page of that day's edition. So remember, this is the guy who she spoke with on the trail. Um, so he didn't really, he didn't report that he saw her on the trail until that Wednesday. Uh, he told reporter Pete Stevenson, Got a lot of names in this case. <laughs> so, I was just thinking that too. That's the, no, like the, so the irony of this is <laughs> we have more information about people involved in this case from the forties than some of the ones we've done in like the seventies, eighties, even where they're just like, even there was 2010. Yeah. There like, wasn't any like police yeah. report really done. They didn't really didn't talk to anybody. This one's got like extreme detail on it. Yeah. I mean, we, we like know like the janitor that like <laughs> swept the, you know, the floor? The floor. <laughs> of wherever I, he janited? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know why I thought of that. Just so, There are a lot of names of people in this case. Yes. <laughs> so he told reporter Pete Stevenson that he had talked to the girl about 4 p.m. Sunday afternoon in Woodford. He and three friends, Stearns uh, and Mary Rice and Lehman Royce, were returning from a camp when a girl approached them and asked directions to the long trail, saying she wanted to walk along it. The girl asked them how far the trail went, and they told her that they had only walked about five miles of it, but that it went uh, through to Canada. She thanked the group and went on her way across the bridge, which led only to the long trail. So we had already mentioned that um, this guy had talked to her, but this is kind of more detail of that interaction. So on this news, Paul's father, um, Paula's father, Frank Howe II, and Pete Stevenson drove to Woodford to begin a search. Three residents confirmed they had seen the girl walking towards the long trail, and she was last seen near a camp called Hunter's Rest. The three men walked towards Glatzenberry, looking 20 feet on each side of the trail to make sure nothing was missed. They continued to camp, they continued to a camp owned by William Lausen, who was about four miles below the fire tower. He, uh, but the going was tough due to around three inches of snow, which fell Sunday night. It was unlikely that she could have reached this camp because she would have had trouble crossing the stream and she was only wearing sneakers. The group did manage to speak to Lausen, but he hadn't seen Paula. He also told them three servicemen had passed through earlier Sunday, also not dressed for the trail, and had left a suitcase with them. Uh, they had not returned, uh, and they looked through the suitcase. The servicemen were named J.W. Carroll, William Watts, and M. Golder. Lausen also said that a deer hunter named Mitty Rivers had disappeared from his camp the year before. There is a ton of activity around this trail. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> for being in the 40s. And, and like, in December. It's Yeah, like everybody's like <laughs> yeah. moving around and stuff. That's, that's wild. Lots of names. Well, so that's what I'm... Okay, so there's something about this. <laughs> Are all these cases really involving this many people and they had like a reporter here that just followed up appropriately and got all the information, do you think? Or is this just a unique one? Because this is the most people that were aware of their actual names and yeah. involvement in this case of most of the cases we do. Well, I think one of the reasons why is this case has captured the imaginations of a lot of people in Vermont in the Northeast for decades so I, one of the websites that I did some additional research on was like the Vermont Historical Society. And they actually have like speakers come and talk about the case periodically at different museums in the area. So this I, specific one? Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. So I think this case, more than a lot of these other cases we've talked about, 
for whatever reason really interests people in that that area and I think there's just been a lot of reporting on it over the years so that's yeah. probably one of the reasons why we have so many names and it seems heavily involved. covered yeah they've like <laughs> yeah. they've done the work yeah so well that, that's that's kind of cool that they've been like this is honestly more people involved in a case, I think, than we've ever done. I know. That's what it feels like. There's <laughs> yeah. just, I don't know who anybody is because <laughs> yeah. there's so many names. I know, like, I forgot who went missing for a little bit. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> when you said Paul on accident, like Paul's father is like, why is Paul's father involved? Where, does he like dating Paula? How does this work? I think, um, yeah, I think I meant Paula's father. I know. I know. Yeah. You No, you corrected it. But when yeah. you first said it, I'm like, I'm lost. I don't know all these people. <laughs> All right, so, let's, let's keep moving. Uh, the authorities concluded there must have been two girls in the area of Long Trail on Sunday, Paula and another woman who was with a man who had a car. <laughs> so there was also another woman matching Paula's description hiking that trail at the same time, which is mind-boggling because, like I said, this is uh, in December, not like the greatest time to hike, uh, you know, in the mountains in Vermont. Yeah. So... Um, they both fitted the description of Paula, except the other woman was taller, and this may have caused some confusion among the witnesses. Especially because she looked like every woman in every picture of the 40s. Yeah. <laughs> so, it's now December 4th, 1946, which is a Wednesday. On Wednesday night, College President Jones issued a statement that authorities suspected foul play and that they believed Paula's body had been concealed. Three men who spent the last weekend at a camp near Glatzenberg had already been questioned. John Proud of the Adams Clothes Store said he had sold clothes to a man on Sunday, Saturday afternoon. <laughs> the man was with two other men at, and said they might be going hiking. Also, that he was a student at a photographic school in New Haven. This man matched the description given by the Fall River Police early Thursday morning. So it is now December 5th, 1946, which is a Thursday. Uh, searches... Uh, searches began at dawn in a seven-square-mile area between Bald and Glad Glatzenberry Mountains. Over 125 people from Bennington and Williams College, as well as locals, assisted in the search led by Sheriff Clyde Peck. The search was hampered by the fact that Vermont had no state police at the time. Eventually, officials from Massachusetts, Connecticut, and New York stepped in to help. So that's kind of interesting, the... You know, in the 40s, some states still didn't have, you know, a state police force. Well, I'm sure they had local, but not, yeah. a, not a state level. It's funny because when you're reading through this, did you ever see the John Mulaney skit when he's talking about how, like, when there's, like, an NCIS show and they're doing an investigation, how everybody just acts not any, like, any way anybody would normally act? No. And you'd be like, my favorite time is when they go question the guy who's working at the docks and two homicide detectives show up, but he's still too busy packing fish to stop. So he'll just keep <laughs> packing and go, not for nothing, but I saw a guy that looked like that come down the road the other day. And they'll have like explicit details about exactly what happened. <laughs> That's what this feels like. They'll kind be like, of, yeah. this guy from this close door remembers exactly what this person bought and he was talking about her. Like there's so much detail. Maybe it speaks to something about how modern life, there's so many distractions that things back then were slower. So, like, people, rec you know, remembered little things like some guy came in and bought clothes that matched this description. It was a simpler time, Mike. People, no, people That's deep. <laughs> I'm being, I'm being serious. I'm joking, but I'm also serious. Like, yeah, ever, it, everyone's not rushing. Think so, like, like, you the, interact with somebody, yeah. you actually talked to them. Think of the attention span of, like, someone in you know, that grew up with TikTok. It's like, like 10 or, seconds. Or the attention span of me? Yeah, or are you? <laughs> I'm bored with this conversation. If, and this is what we're here to do. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Joe just left. Yeah. <laughs> it's just you know. Imagine the attention span of people that were born. I put the camera away, come back, my chair's just spinning. <laughs> Where'd he go? And I'm outside buying an ice cream cone. <laughs> But he looked at me, there's a guy outside with yo-yos. I'm just playing with one. I mean, in all honesty, <laughs> would someone t in today's day and age even know any of this happened because they'd just be staring at their phone? Yeah, I'll agree with you, <laughs> uh, unless they're, like, weird. So if I was a store owner and I had a customer and it felt weird, I'd probably remember them. Yeah. But outside of that, like, in a bu the busy, uh, I mean, look at how many people walk by our window that I yeah. glanced at. I couldn't describe oh, any yeah. of them. I mean, I've seen people out on trails hiking in national parks buried in their phones. 
while they're going down the trail. Yeah. Like, you can't like, even put your phone down. Yeah, like, there's no signal. What are you yeah, even what doing? what are you doing? They're just like, this is my habit. I can't. It's like I, smoking a cigarette. Like, they just have yeah, to look at the phone. Yeah, they have to look at a phone. I'm guilty sometimes, too. So, yeah, I, I, I mean, feel like I can, I feel, I feel like I can call people out that do that because I'm one of them. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, getting back to our case, we have gotten sidetracked so much. It's worth it, though. It is. Content. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, five aircraft were actually deployed, as well as 120 men from the State Guard, meaning that nearly 500 searchers were involved. Each uh, do we have the names of all the men deployed in the 500 searchers? Because I really would love a list. I was actually <laughs> just going to go down the roll call of the 120 guys from the State I Guard. I want to make sure. I want to know what they all did specifically. <laughs> um, each searcher carried confetti to drop to ensure each area was searched and none searched twice. So... Uh, inexperienced and littering. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they weren't concerned about stuff back then. We can't really hold them I to know. account to I'm our standards. But, well, it probably was like paper confetti. So I'm it's sure like biodegraded. It, it, yeah. Like now they would be like plastic and stuff. It's probably paper. So it's probably gone in like two weeks. Probably like radioactive. Material. <laughs> yeah, actually it's probably, it's probably worse than plastic. <laughs> um, so like I said, they, uh, they were trapping confetti. A thorough search of the Blue Trail over Bald Mountain was made after a Bennington College faculty member found footprints Wednesday afternoon that might have been made by sneakers. But the 500 searchers found nothing. The search of Long Trail was concluded, and the authorities believe Paula was not in the area. Her father at the time said he was satisfied with the search and the way it was conducted. Uh, A woodsman on the eastern slope of Glatzenberry near uh, Searsburg, reported he had heard what he thought was a woman screaming, and the authorities checked the area and found nothing. Uh, As the search continued, several false leads emerged, including sightings of Paula in New York City and Canada. These reports were investigated but dismissed as unfounded. So despite a lot of tips and leads, none of them led to Paula's whereabouts. So it is now December 15th of 1946. This was when the official search operation came to an end. In May the following year, when the snow melted, Paula's father, I kept writing Paul's. I don't know. It was late. That's okay. Paula's father organized another two-day search, but no trace of Paula was found. Now he's criticizing the authorities. So he he was happy with the search and then... Initially. Now criticized. Okay. Next May. So That's a very common thing I think we see. Like, it's... Again, uh, he's in a peculiar spot, a terrible spot. Yeah. It seems like that's kind of the go-to. Like, it's almost like, you know how you do the stages of grief? It's almost mm-hmm. like the stages of, like, a search and rescue. It's, okay, it didn't, what we were doing didn't work. Whose yeah. fault is it? So they blame the searchers. I, yeah, it's, it, I'm sure that's what, <clears throat> you know, I'm not going to blame them. I've never been through it. Maybe I would do the same thing. No, and I think if you everyone. Feel, if you feel hopeless. Everyone wants, you know, the authorities to spend you know, whatever it takes and do whatever they have to in the search. But in reality is there's constraints and there's only so much, you know, resources they can bring out for somebody, especially if they're not exactly sure where their last location was. In this case, you know, they have an idea of, you know, someone saw her on the trail, but like we said, it's a 200 and what, 70 mile trail. Yeah. And it's in a huge national forest. She could be anywhere. She was hitchhiking. I mean, and, you know, search techniques back then weren't as developed as they are now. They had a bunch of inexperienced people out there. I mean, they did everything they could. Yeah. So, but he criticized the authorities for a lack of sophistica- sophisticated methods in handling the case, which actually, this actually served as a catalyst for the founding of the Vermont State Police a couple months later. So oh, wow. Something good came from it. Um, and this disappearance at the time was one of the largest search and rescue operations in Vermont's history. So the search in total involved thousands of volunteers, including Bennington College students, uh, local residents, members of the National Guard, and the search went for several weeks, but it was eventually scaled back, obviously, to lack of leads. And there is some really old-timey helicopter. Yeah. (laughs) I was pulling up the Bell helicopter, and I was showing the uh, people looking at a map on Long Trail. Yeah. yeah, these all look like they're fake, like, they're just generated images. I know. I mean, there's a Boy Scout, and you've got a cop. Looks like a lumberjack. And or a- <laughs> they're, prob- they're probably, like, 
20 years old and they look like they're 50. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like life was harder. I know. That's what I'm saying. Like they're all just like all of these people are teenagers. <laughs> like, yeah. like probably. I don't know that for a fact. I'm just kidding. Though the but, boy scout looks like he's in his twenties. Yeah, he does. So. I is it, oh yeah. He's got the little, the thing, huh? That's a boy scout. He's probably an Eagle scout at that point. Yeah. I don't know. I, don't, I hope so. So the case pretty much went cold after the search, but there was a interesting character that kept appearing in this case for several decades after. Um, the guy's name was Fred Gadette, and he was a person of interest in this case for almost 20 years. <laughs> he lived in a shack near the Long Trail and had been interviewed as a witness, though each interview resulted in changes in his story. In 1955, Gadette came forward and confessed, confessed to knowing where Paula's body was buried. After intense questioning, however, the lumberjack admitted to making this whole story up to get attention. However, after claiming the confession was false, Cadet apparently drunkenly boasted about killing Paula and hiding her body. He was never arrested or formally accused, though the last actual discovery in the case took place in 1968 when skeletal remains were found near the site of Paula's disappearance. But upon further investigation into the find, uh, it was ruled as too old to be Paula. Uh, the case has since remained cold and um, still shared wi- widely around the internet. So this is um, truly a cold case. But a couple things, like we said, did come out of this in the aftermath. So, like I said, it was the main catalyst for Vermont to establish their own police force. The governor, governor effectively used her as a way to shame the legislature for their greediness. Uh, they had previously voted the idea of a state police force down because they did not because they uh, wanted to. They did not save the money. Oh, okay. So I, you know, that's never stopped politicians before. Yeah, using well, back the then before they were just printing it. Tragic disappearance of a young. Yeah, woman here's here's to, Fred Gadet. Hmm. I don't know if he looks guilty from this photo. <laughs> it's hard to tell. Yeah. Um, so, uh, what else? So, that's kind of the the timeline. Lots of names. I feel like we should almost put like a like a legend in the bottom of the show notes with all the various. We could names. do like a family tree, <laughs> I know. like and just like have like a like a plotter graph or something of the I'm people still, in relation to the case. Yeah, there's so many people in this case. Uh, so jumping right into theories, I'll go into some of the official media theories, and then we can we can give our take in it. So some of the official theories, uh, investigators initially believed Paula had gotten lost in the mountains and died of exposure. But as time passed, without their finding uh, any sign of her, they began to consider other theories. Authorities looked into Paula's background to see if she might have left of her own accord. Uh, She had never had a steady boyfriend, and she was a good student majoring in art, but she had lately become less interested in the subject. She found herself drawn to music and botany instead of Stead and may have been thinking of changing her major. She probably was even listening to that devilish music by... Um, Elvis, is that what <laughs> is that what it says? No, I, I oh, I'm. Oh, I'm like, I'm like that's I, that's so forties. No, I just remember back. I don't. I don't think Elvis was that. He wasn't in the forties. I don't know. Maybe I don't, he was. I, didn't he serve in the military? Yes, he did. He was in the army. But remember back then, like his music was like the devil. Yes, you, you couldn't because he'd to shuck it. his hips too yeah. many times. <laughs> it's always kind of funny to me. Ain't no motor home, no. <laughs> Uh, So, although there were reports that she was somewhat depressed at the time of her disappearance, her family and friends said she only had normal problems for a girl her age and was not unhappy enough to commit suicide or run away from home. So, case solved wasn't wasn't that. (laughs) So, uh, just stepping back, Elvis uh, was active between 1953 and 1977. So, she would have not have been listening to... So, my joke is not relevant. Yeah, I just just crapped all over your joke. (laughs) Sorry. Um, finally, she had left all her belongings behind and her family stated she was not the type of person to leave without warning. So family and friends didn't think it was suicide. Um, and I would believe that she's like asking people about the trail and stuff. Yeah. Like that's, why would she talk to anybody? Why would she care where it went if her goal was to just go out there and exactly not come back? Yes. Um, 
So, you know, what a family and friends think. Uh, her family is still unsure as um, much of the case was stifled due to the lack of police reports and a lack of documentation for the first 10 days of her disappearance. Initially, her father held out hope that Paula was alive and even drove to the place Paula was sighted. However, um, he officially packed up her belongings from college and brought them home on the 16th. So media opinions at the time. So one of the biggest ones was foul play. Um, they think she could have been a victim of foul play. Some believe she was abducted and murdered by a stranger or someone she knew. Others speculate that she was the victim of a serial killer operating in the area at the time. However, no evidence of foul play had ever been found. Another popular theory was wilderness accident. Um, they said it's also possible that Paula got lost or injured in the woods and died of exposure, starvation, or dehydration. However, um, this theory at the time seemed unlikely given Paula's experience as a camper and hiker, as well as the extensive search and rescue efforts that were conducted. I would just counter that and say she was completely unprepared for the conditions. Yeah, even <clears> – <throat> I know you said it, but I just pulled up a news article from yeah. when it was. And it, was, it sh says she was not dressed for the near-zero weather, prevailing here wearing only a red jacket, blue jeans, and sneakers. Yeah. So just, yeah, not the right gear at all. So I, wouldn't, I don't know that I'd necessarily call that experience um, – <laughs> one of the uh, I maybe experience but experience people are if she's thinking I'm just going to go for a walk it's yeah. 50 degrees and I'll be out and back sure that's fine yeah but not if you get stuck yeah. or something happens um another one that you find out on the deep end in like reddit forums is alien abduction um, of course and the one that piqued my interest I didn't know we had another triangle in the US we'll we'll have to do a uh, what? A, a myth episode on this. Um, but it's called the Bennington Triangle. The area where Paula went missing has been rife with supernatural rumors, and a total of five people have gone missing within this area. All right. If there's a lot of detail on it, maybe hold off and, and like peruse it and get just uh, maybe some teasers because we'll have to do a whole thing on it. Yeah. Give it a high level. Over high there. level. Well, that's pretty much author. Joseph uh, Citro came up with the name Bennington triangle in 1992 and noted the many strange occurrences that seem to take place in the area. In addition to these disappearances, there have been sightings in the area of cryptids such as Bigfoot, as well as UFO sightings. Some even believe that the land itself, particularly around Glatzenberry mountain is the triangle center and is cursed. Okay. <laughs> so I think we have a, uh... A theory in an episode. A be the Bennington Triangle. The we Bennington still, Triangle. We still got to do about the, uh, there's a triangle in the Lake Michigan that we've never covered. N in the northern part? No, in like the lake. The boats well, yeah, nor northern no, part it, of the it lake? No, it comes down like through, like down to Chicago. and Really? Yeah. Okay. So. that that I, I feel like we can explain that one though. Do they all go missing like in November and December? <laughs> I don't know. You know what I'm talking about, yeah. right? When the gales of November come early. <laughs> Gordon Lightfoot. Yes. Just passed away. I know. Oh, that's a good song. <laughs> pour one out for him. Yeah. I'm going to pour out this uh, delicious Cherry Coke Zero. Uh, unofficial sponsor of the show, Cherry Coke Zero. If you want to get cancer early, drink Coke Zero. Yeah, I think they just classified whatever they sweeten this stuff with. I mean, like, everybody knew, but I think they just said it. That, like, uh, what, aspartame? I mean... Shot for shot, what's worse for your body? Tequila this? or t Diet Coke? This probably. <laughs> probably is. Tequila comes from like agave f like okay. plants. This is like... Diet uh, Coke or a shot of gasoline. <laughs> mm. <laughs> you know like Coke and Pepsi can like clean rust off of like tools. So you're saying maybe gasoline would be better to take a shot of... Same amount of volume? <laughs> Just one shot. One shot of equal? Then yeah, the Coke's fine. Okay. <laughs> Barely. Barely. <laughs> but yeah, thank you, Coke, for sponsoring. Is it, is the it gasoline flavored? Cherry Coke flavored ga cher cherry flavored <laughs> gasoline. Cherry flavored gasoline. Thank you, uh, Coca Cola, for sponsoring the show. We would have said nice stuff if you sp actually sponsored <laughs> us. Um, so that's the end of the actual theories. <laughs> what do you <laughs> no, tangent number fifty? I um. What do you think? Happened? I want to go back to uh, James something that owned. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Uh, let's see. I well, at first I didn't say anything because I've done this before. Uh, when it talked about she was hitchhiking, I thought that was the last person that saw her. I'm like, well, yeah. that seems obvious. The last person that was with her picked her up in a car yeah. alone. 
Uh, but then it, it sounded like she, she ran into uh, several other people on the trail. Yep. Uh, and those people were in groups. I still, I'm, I would say I'm leaning more towards foul play. Yeah. I am just because from what it looked like on the screen, um, I'm not sharing it, but I'll pull it up for us. It doesn't look wildly overgrown or difficult. So yeah. like I was going through a lot of the, uh, all it trails, 65,000 feet of elevation gain. Yeah, but that's over the, the entire like length of 200 miles no, of the know. state. So, I mean, um, it looked like the area she was on again, I'm, I'm going off of a map that it was pretty wide open. Like you're not going to get too lost. Yeah. Um, you know, cause it's, it's elevated. It looks very sparsely populated. Yeah. I don't know. I just, it doesn't look too, I've seen thicker forests. I'll mm-hmm. just say that. And yeah, this is the area essentially this somewhere in there. Yeah. Somewhere in here. They don't have street view, do they? That'd be cool. Sometimes they do. Like Google's sent, you know, you ever see, remember when they had those backpacks? Yeah. That they would bring on the trails that were really cool. I think I saw it once. I saw someone. Yeah. It was like a dome on the top of a backpack. Yeah. It was like, uh, it was like a 50 pound backpack with like a, like a thing sticking out of the top of it with like a, like a 360 camera. Yes. So they would do that to, um, real popular trails. Yeah, exactly. So maybe, maybe not this one. Yeah. I probably not. I'm not seeing any. Sometimes you can find pictures people took of the trail. They'll That's what I was like just looking on here. It's it, This dot. is it right here. I mean, look at You can see it from satellite. Yeah. So I can see the trail from the satellite. I mean, this is now it's, versus back in the 40s. Well, okay. Was it just logged recently? So, like, I, it could be even better. But look at it. You can kind of see it from here. So assuming, you know, it was that visible, I don't, like, she's not going to go much farther. Yeah. I'm just trying to think common sense. Like, why? She's hiked before. I'm going to give her the benefit of the doubt. Um, did they say the guy who um, said he heard the scream lied, the logger, or was that somebody different? That was someone different. So, like, is it possible he heard her being abducted or something like that? Possible. Like the, they they investigated the area where he thought he heard it, and they didn't find anything. Yeah, there's a fresh snowfall. Mm-hmm. So, if there's, like, a scuffle of some sort and then a fresh snowfall comes, like, you're not going to see anything. And then everyone is trampling around in the search area. Yeah. Like, if you've got boot, boot prints everywhere, all that stuff. Like, so, I'm going to go with the most basic, uh, I'm guessing she was abducted. And I actually, I was yeah. leaning towards something happening to her in the wilderness, but I'm actually kind of leaning towards abduction. And... If there was some kind of struggle, like you said, it probably got totally disturbed by all those people stomping around out there. Yeah. And, you know, just the fact that there's guys, like, living in shacks near the trail. and That's kind of what got me. Is like, it seemed like there's a lot of activity there, but it's, like, people who live in the backcountry and, <laughs> yeah. like, might be a little goofy. Yeah. So I I think I'm with you on this one. I do think it's foul, foul play because um, there was no indication that she – Based on how she dressed and, you know, going off their word that she was experienced, it sounded like she planned on coming back. Yeah, Um, I agree with that. Yeah, so I I think it's foul play. I think a lot of cases will cover a case where it's very remote. No one's living around the trail. Mm -hmm. And for you to abduct somebody, it would take a lot of effort. But here, it seems like there's a lot of odd ducks living right near the trail. Yeah, we know like all of them. Living in shacks and yeah, and we talked about uh, several of them. Yeah. It could even this cadet guy could have even actually been the one who killed her. Yeah. Um it's just kind of odd for 20 years he kept inserting himself into this case. That's where it's like was it like uh the guilt or like they he just has to keep talking about it because yeah. he hasn't been caught. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I definitely, yeah, I think I'm leaning towards your theory that it was foul play, so. All right. And what's what's your off the deep end? Do you, um, do you have one? Bigfoot from the Bennington Triangle. Bigfoot from the Bennington Triangle. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> I think, I, I also think it was that. Yeah. All right, well, thanks again for tuning into our show. We appreciate you all for 
listening and sharing locations and own with your friends and family. Be sure to like and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, where you can find the videos of each episode. Also, if you'd like to support the show monetarily, please visit our website or our Facebook store to buy some sweet, sweet swag. And you can subscribe to our Patreon account or on YouTube and Apple subscriptions where you'll have access to special events and additional shows like the one we're going to be recording shortly. Yes. Uh, that is for paid customers only. And lastly, when enjoying the beauty of nature, whether backpacking, camping, or simply taking a walk, always remember to leave no trace. Thank you, and we will see y'all next time. <laughs> <laughs>